I'm Jason Lee. Thank you for inviting me to Oktoberfest again this year. I really enjoy talking about these topics, so thank you. My usual full disclosure statement uh, boils down to the fact that I have no financial ties with any of the DNA testing, DNA matching companies, so I don't profit from or benefit from the sales of DNA test kits or memberships or any of that and I come to you with a fully independent perspective on things. So, <clears throat> um, I've asked in the past um, people in genealogy groups about triangulation. In particular, I've asked in um, the group that I administer, Ancestor DNA Matching, um, how well do you understand triangulation? Um, triangulation isn't possible at Ancestor DNA. Um, so it's not a surprise that um, in a group where um, most of the people are focused on ancestry DNA, um, there is um, a need to um, learn more about triangulation. So in that group, about 80% 80, 80 of the people said that they barely understood triangulation or they didn't understand triangulation at all. And about 20% uh, um, had some um, knowledge. Um, and we're fairly comfortable with it. So um, with that in mind, uh, when I talk about triangulation, I um, generally um, go at it at a beginner's level, um, but I also feature information about the more advanced techniques uh, to give an idea of what will be possible if you keep at it. Um, I really want people to know that this is an amazing tool and it's not really terribly difficult to use, but with some time and experience, some really amazing things can happen. Why do we tri triangulate? Uh, we triangulate to eliminate DNA connections, to identify relatives, uh, to untangle uh, tangled up um, ancestral relationships. I've heard some people indicate that they can't triangulate because it's such a mess. Uh, to the contrary, um, triangulation really cleans up the messes. So um, I think that if there's a problem with triangulation in the setting of um, tangled up um, ancestral relationships, um, we just need to uh, take a closer look and, and, and see how triangulation can actually help. Um, ultimately, we're hoping to confirm relationships and break down brick walls, and um, I'll, I'll provide some examples. One of the surprising benefits that I've seen from triangulation is that triangulation can give us some information that can really help us to connect with our DNA matches. Um, genetic genealogy is very collaborative. Uh, there's very little that we can do without help from our matches, at least some help from some of our matches to put things into context. Um, it's not like going into the courthouse all day long and working alone. Uh, you really have to have some cooperation, some collaboration to get anywhere with genetic genealogy. And so um, it's a source of constant frustration. How do I get people to respond? How do I get, how do I get people interested? I need, really need some help to figure out where this piece of the puzzle fits in. Um, I've found that triangulation um, can help me move things forward enough to generate some interesting information to get some responses from my matches. And I'll give a clear example of that as we go along. What is triangulation? I'll spend a lot of time um, fleshing that out as we go through. Um, the simple answer is that we're looking at shared DNA and shared ancestry to explore family relationships. Um, unfortunately, triangulation has become a very broad term that's applied to at least two very different processes in genetic genealogy. One is where we look at shared segments of DNA to find shared ancestry. Um, another is a process where we look at lists of shared matches, matches that maybe you and I share. We share a list of matches. We go through that list of matches to look, look for what's in common. Um, <clears throat> these are really very different processes. Um, and so it's unfortunately, I think it's unfortunate that triangulation has been used to describe both of these processes, but it is being used. And so uh, we wanna be very clear. Um, for some of us, maybe uh, the term triangulation brings bad flashbacks to high school math. Um, I want to reassure you that triangulation 
does not involve any math at all. You couldn't apply math if you wanted to. It's not a mathematical uh, process. It's not, it's not based on in math at all. So there are some parallels. Um, you, you can compare triangulation that we use for family history with triangulation from math. Um, one of the parallels is that um, as with uh, the triangulation that um, we did in math class, uh, you can take bits and pieces of information and come up with amazing results. So we may not have uh, a way of directly measuring the distance from the shoreline to this boat off in the distance, but if we have a few bits and pieces of information, we can figure out that distance without measuring it directly. Um, and likewise, with family history triangulation, um, we can uh, figure out some really amazing things uh, with bits and pieces of information that um, tell us things that uh, we wouldn't have been able to figure out with um, direct uh, measurements or direct um, analysis. So um, we'll make that more clear as we go along. Another parallel is that we do have to be careful when we're triangulating. Uh, we have to be sure that we know what we're measuring and we can't, we can't be careless or we're going to get bad results. So this is where I'm kind of comparing mathematical triangulation with family tree triangulation. Obviously, if we draw the lines in the wrong place and make bad assumptions, we're going to come up with nonsense. So we, have, we do have to be careful. But beyond that, uh, there aren't really any uh, similarities. Um, the triangulation that we do for family history is, is not based in math. Um, Maurice Gleason uh, did a presentation that I found online and I, and I thought that was interesting because of the way that he described the two different kinds of triangulation that, that I'm talking about here in the first part of this presentation. Um, when he talks about uh, shared matches triangulation, he refers to it as messy triangulation. And when he talks about shared segment triangulation, he uses the term purist triangulation. So I thought that was a fun way of thinking about the two kinds of triangulation. But uh, for me, um, I, I say matchless triangulation when people are talking about going through shared match lists to find shared ancestry. And I use the term segment triangulation to talk about the process where we're looking at DNA directly, more directly at the DNA to find shared ancestry. Um, so that's where I, where I come at it from. So um, to give an example of matchless triangulation, I'll talk about David M. Peoples. He's my second great grandfather. I don't know who his parents were. I think I'm getting close. What I might do if I were to try to use matchless triangulation to learn more about his family, hopefully his parents, I would look at a match like Jess. Jess is also a descendant of David Peoples. And Jess and I share 119 matches. And what we could do with matchless triangulation is to go through that list of 119 matches to try to find clues about David's parents um, or other relatives. And so that's very straightforward. Um, and that's one of the uh, attractions of matchless triangulation. It's, it's easy. You're casting a wide net. Um, you're not really having to dig deep into details that are unfamiliar, uh, such as the details of uh, DNA match results. So it's pretty straightforward, and I think that's the, 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 the biggest attraction. On the other hand, there are some downsides. So uh, for example, with David and Peoples, we, we won't just be getting um, connections relating to um, David's family, but also uh, his wife's family. So B.D. Youngblood, uh, Jess and I both descend from David and his wife. And um, when we go through our match lists, we're going to be finding uh, matches uh, who are connected uh, to um, both of those lines. Um, even more, um, uh, an, a, yet another layer of complication here for us is that um, uh, Jess and I descend not only from David and Beatty, but also another unrelated couple, Silas and Nancy. Um, so it's not. Um, it's not uncommon to see this, I think, and, and we certainly see this here. And um, we do see matches, uh, shared matches um, relating to this other couple. 
So um, things can get fairly messy. And I think um, some people um, are unaware of this or, or, or feel like they, they're they not really part of this kind of um, problem. But um, I would point out that um, as American genealogists, um, we're um, not um, immune from this kind of situation. So um, going back in history to 1790, 19 out of 20 people um, in America were living in rural settings. In 1870, it was still three quarters. It didn't come to about 50-50 until 1920 or so. Um, and in terms of family history, that's essentially yesterday. Uh, we only have to go back a generation or two um, to, to get to that um, time frame. And so um, we have to remember that our ancestors did not have a vast array of options for marriage partners and uh, cousin marriage um, was not um, uncommon at all. And I'm not just talking about uh, first cousins, uh, second and third cousins um, contribute to the confusion that we see with our family history research and our, our DNA connections. Um, and um, that was not really unusual at all. And in addition to this, we often see um, a similar situation where you might have siblings from uh, family A marrying a bunch of siblings from uh, family B, and um, you get a lot of tangled up messes as a result of that as well. Um, and to hammer this point in a little bit more, I think, again, there are people who seem to assume that uh, cousin marriage was only happening in um, less prestigious areas among less prestigious groups. But uh, Charles Darwin, of all people, who uh, surely understood the challenges that come with cousin marriage, married his own first cousin in 1839. So there, there it is for what it's worth. Um, getting back to matchless triangulation and the challenges that we deal with, um, it's a, such a wide net, it can be really too wide. And what the expectation is, is that uh, perhaps I match A, um, excuse me, I, I, perhaps I being match A, uh, share DNA with uh, person match B. And perhaps we match because uh, we see this seller's line that we have in common. And uh, what we're hoping is that um, I match C as well uh, because of the same seller's line. And we can conclude, therefore, that uh, B matches C because of that seller's line that, that we all three have in common. This is what we hope to see. So pretty straightforward. Um, things are all fitting together in a, in a simple, neat little way. But what we in, in reality often see is that um, A matches B because of the sh shared seller's line. Um, A matches C uh, because of another line. And B matches C because of yet another line. So um, we're, we're connected in so many different ways. It's just really difficult to draw any firm conclusions in a lot of cases. Um, Dana Leeds has come up with a process for dealing with this, and some people have automated this process. You can look into that. Um, I think the clustering is very helpful. Um, I've, I've seen some great examples of where clustering really puts things together in a nice way, um, and it's really based on match list triangulation. Um, and again, it can be either done um, ma manually or um, with automated tools that people have developed. Um, you can look into that. That's beyond the scope of this discussion. But um, what I want to talk about today mostly is segment triangulation. So segment triangulation is basically a process. You can think of it this way. Um, two people um, look at a segment of DNA that they share. We'll talk about what segments are. Two people look at a shared segment of DNA. And then they go forward to look for other people who share that segment. And then... Uh, the next step is to look for ancestry shared by all of the people who share that segment of interest. And, and we'll get into the details of how we do this. So here's um, an example. Um, this is a chromosome browser result for a DNA comparison between two cousins. This is me and uh, one of my second cousins. And we might start by going for this biggest segment on chromosome 17. That's probably where 
um, we're going to find the easiest answers, the biggest segment. So we're focused on this uh, chromosome se this segment on chromosome 17, and we start to sort through family connections, um, and we look for additional matches, and we go through this one step at a time. So me and the, the second cousin uh, might share all of these lines, Arnold, Lloyd, Smith, Willis, um, and then we look for another person who shares segment uh, the segment on chromosome 17, and um, this person perhaps only shares Lloyd, Smith, and Willis, and then um, we've narrowed things down a bit, we move on, we find yet another match who shares the segment on chromosome 17, and perhaps this match only shares the Willis line with the rest of us in this group, and we've narrowed things further, and we've begun to see where this segment is likely to have come from, and perhaps if we look very carefully, we can uh, find that there is a very, very specific individual who's responsible for this segment that we all inherited. And if this is someone that we didn't know much about previously, um, this is an opportunity to learn something that we didn't know before, maybe solidify some research, add some certainty to an uncertain situation, and, and move through the process step by step. And this becomes a process where uh, the paper trail reinforces the DNA, the DNA reinforces the paper trail, and you kind of go step by step, um, adding certainty as you go along. So pros and cons of segment triangulation. Um, with segment triangulation, you're really eliminating a lot of the irrelevant lines and irrelevant connections, or at least the connections and lines that you're not interested in. It's less messy than um, uh, matchless triangulation much more focused. Um, matches are, are, are easier to sort. You can cut through a lot of clutter. Downsides, this is uh, totally unavailable at Ancestry DNA. Segment triangulation is not a possibility there, unfortunately. Hopefully, uh, tools that help us with segment triangulation will appear in the future. It will require some interest. Uh, people will have to learn about triangulation, know about it, see the benefits, and demand the benefits, or, or at least request the benefits at Ancestry so that we can take advantage of this in their large database. Um, another downside um, with the segment triangulation, it's not as easy just to jump right in without uh, some uh, new knowledge and some experience, so you do have to work at it a bit more. Uh, but I really don't think that it's inaccessible to most people, so I, I want to encourage more people to, to look at it. A lot of people have gotten into silly arguments about what is better, is, is matchless triangulation and, and clustering better than segment triangulation, or is segment triangulation better than matchless triangulation. Um, I have my preference, but I think that if we're asking which one of these two processes is better, we're really asking the wrong question. Um, it's, it's, it's really, we really should be thinking of it that way. And it reminds me of this old meme where the little girl is saying, well, why don't we just have both? And, and she becomes the town hero for, hero for thinking a little bit outside of the box. So I would say, let's not think about which should you use or which is the best. Um, the, the answer is that we should use every tool that we can find as well as we can use it in every situation to get the best results. So um, let's, let's use both of these processes. So here's an example of matchless triangulation. Um, I have a segment on chromosome one that came from my spivey relatives. This is a, I think this is a very interesting segment. Um, I, I got a new uh, match to this segment um, just a week or two ago, pretty big breakthrough. Uh, didn't have time to add that part of the story to these slides, but um, it's really been uh, challenging and interesting at the same time. Um, in spite of all of the challenges and per perhaps in, because of some of these challenges, it's really been, been um, exciting to go through this. So um, bigamy, donor conception, adoption, NPEs, all kinds of interesting things uh, complicating and um, making this a, a fascinating study. So um, in this, uh, presentation, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on the 23andMe tested matches 
of this uh, triangulation group because uh, 23andMe has such a good chromosome browser and is really uh, easier to um, illustrate the concepts with their chromosome browser because it's so versatile. Um, I'll note that with this triangulation group um, on chromosome 1, none of the matches have trees. Um, I had to build their trees myself, and half of these matches never responded through the years. Uh, I've been working on this group for years, and, and, and that's something to take note of. Um, sometimes um, triangulation isn't going to provide answers overnight. You have to work and work and work. Um, but um, hopefully you'll see enough promise and potential in the beginning that you can see that this is something that's worth pursuing in spite of all kinds of challenges. So um, here are the people of the group that I'm highlighting. Um, these people are being compared with me in the chromosome browser. So this is me being compared with Bobby, Sherry, Pam, and Mitchell. And as you can see, uh, with these colored bars uh, that correspond to these people, um, we all share DNA here on this part of chromosome one. And some of these segments are, are quite large, and um, that gives us opportunity to um, look at some interesting questions. So uh, moving on, um, because of the versatility of the chromosome browser at 23andMe, I can go ahead and compare each one of those people in, in the group um, against everybody else in the group. And that's an important part of the process of DNA triangulation. Uh, you want to compare and recompare and sort things out and be sure that everyone matches everyone else. Um, so as we can see, now we're comparing uh, Bobby with Sherry, Pam, Mitchell, and me. Um, everything's lining up nicely. We move along. Now we're comparing everybody with Sherry. So Bobby, Pam, Mitchell, and me versus Sherry. Um, everything's lining up nicely. Um, this is where we get to a little bit of a hiccup in the uh, process, and I kind of hesitated to um, include this in the example because I don't want people to be confused, but I decided I'm going to include this in this introductory uh, talk um, anyway because um, I want people to understand that just because you see something that appears to be a problem, um, I, you shouldn't um, hesitate to continue moving forward. You, you don't want to jump to conclusions and say, well, this thing's falling apart because I see a hole. Um, in this case, Pam doesn't appear to match Mitchell. And so that might raise some questions as to whether Pam or Mitchell are not um, part of this group. Um, this zero might scare some people. But I would say, look at the overwhelming um, abundance of evidence and um, don't let one little blip throw you off. So if we move along actually and go back to the beginning, we can see that um, there's enough overlap here with uh, Pam in uh, the yellowish orangish color and Mitchell in this teal blue uh, color uh, that maybe there really is something going on here. And I think the answer in this case pretty clearly is that uh, they actually do share DNA on chromosome 1, um, but it's just below the threshold that 23andMe finds to be acceptable. So um, again, going back through some of the other comparisons, um, I think we can see that uh, Pam and Bobby, um, act, excuse me, Pam and Mitchell actually do um, share some DNA here. It's just um, not as um, it's just not being shown in the direct comparison because it is a very small amount of DNA. So again, um, there appears to be a little problem here, uh, but I would say um, there really isn't a problem. And uh, to alleviate any lingering doubts, um, 23andMe has a, a tool that they can combine with their match lists where they indicate uh, triangulation. And um, when we pull up uh, Mitchell in that tool, we can see that he does indeed triangulate with Bobby and Sherry and Sherry's daughter, Tracy. So I would say that um, 
there, there's really no doubt that, that Mitchell's a part of this triangulation group. So again, I kind of hesitated to get into some of the thorny issues here in, in an introductory discussion of DNA triangulation, but I went ahead and included this because I do want people to understand that um, you'll occasionally run across things that aren't entirely obvious. You'll run into things that maybe make you think that something's wrong. And I would just encourage you to move, move ahead, uh, make additional comparisons, think about where the overwhelming weight of the evidence is leading you, and if you still have any lingering doubts, go ahead and go to a group um, on Facebook. There are lots of uh, genetic genealogy uh, groups on Facebook. Um, you can ask people who have more experience to explain it. Um, the first response that you get may not come from the most experienced person. So be patient. See what, what people have to say about it. See if you can get some insights from some discussion online. Um, and, and I would certainly invite you to Ancestry DNA Matching where... Um, we have um, over 101,000 people, and there's always a, a, a good group of people who are um, ready to help you out and, and figure out situations like this. Um, so notes on this uh, situation. Uh, the matches of this triangulation group share additional DNA with my family. So we're not just relying on this one segment on chromosome one. There are other segments involved, and we don't have time to get into all of the segments of all of the spivey relatives that I have that would that would take quite a long time. Uh, but we can learn a lot from this one segment. Just keep in mind that it's, uh, it's uh, one piece of a bigger puzzle. Um, and if we go and triangulate other segments shared by various spivey relatives, we get similar results. So um, the significance of this uh, particular analysis uh, in this process uh, we begin to confirm that the shared DNA came from a single ancestral source. Um, and um, in this case, uh, the ancestral source wasn't easy to confirm because so many of these people um, were um, not willing to communicate or weren't getting the messages. And some of the people had no idea how they would be related to me. But over time, um, I was able to put some pieces together and make this all come together. So for example, Pam uh, was adopted, uh, but she has so many spivey connections and she's the member of so many triangula triangulation groups that are uh, connected to spivey ancestry that um, long before we found out who her father is, we were able to conclude without any doubt that um, she is a spivey relative. Um, Sherry um, is on 23andMe and has a long list of surnames on her profile page. One of those surnames is Spivey, so that was, was a, a nice clue. But there, there's no tree there, and so I had to figure this out for myself. Um, Bobby, um, no tree, no list of surnames, no responses to my messages, still no responses to my messages uh, years and years later. Um, but his segment on chromosome one is so large, over 60 centimorgans, it still turned out to be useful. Um, and, and, and so because of uh, the promise that that segment uh, held, um, I went the extra mile to find Bobby uh, using um, his name and having access to his picture on 23andMe. It was ultimately possible. Mitchell... Um, he also has no tree as, that I can find. Uh, he listed no surnames. He never responded to any of my messages, but um, his name stood out enough uh, that I was encouraged to go ahead and pursue the research on um, him. And um, because he has a um, Hispanic surname, that really... Um, helped to cut through a lot of clutter um, where um, he wasn't blending in with the rest of my matches who have uh, predominantly uh, British and German ancestry. Um, and I did a simple Google search and um, managed to, to find him and his ancestry. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Pam, despite the fact that she's an adoptee, turned out to be the most important match in this group. So again, I don't want adoptees or people who are working with adoptees to be discouraged because 
um, with the power of triangulation, um, we can make use of uh, the match lists and the triangulation groups that our adoptee matches um, generate. Um, it's really amazing. With, with Pam, it was very clear because of the fact that um, she shares 131 centimorgans with my family, which is a good amount. Um, and because each one of those segments that she shares with my family appears to be um, DNA that was passed down from Spivey ancestry, we were very confident about her being a Spivey long before her bio parents and her uh, biological father uh, was identified. Um, so I want people to keep that in mind. Um, it, it's really amazing how well triangulation can help us um, make these determinations long before we confirm what we're looking to confirm. So again, Pam's um, spivey connections were clear long before her biological parents were uh, found. And Sherry being a good match to Pam um, added to that confidence. Um, Sherry um, was the one I mentioned earlier who had a good list of surnames. And by working with those surnames and doing various Google searches with a lot of different combinations of the uh, surnames on the list, um, I eventually managed to put together the uh, family tree um, and um, found the shared Spivey ancestry, uh, Daniel Spivey and Selena Lankford. So um, with that knowledge, I went ahead and said, hey, um, look what I found. Um, and, and I found that this is a, a really powerful way to get people involved who probably wouldn't be involved otherwise. Um, so my old method, um, and, and I think it's uh, not a terribly bad method when, when uh, there aren't any other options, my old method was simply to send out the form letter that uh, 23andMe provides and, and at least um, make a, a tiny effort to, to make a connection. Uh, unfortunately, response rates are very low with messages that aren't personalized, as, as, and then of course that's easy to understand. Uh, but in a lot of cases, there's not a lot to work with. Um, now though, working with triangulation and, and using that process to um, find things in common, um, the response rate is so much better. So the new method, here's how I co contacted Sherry's family. I said, hi, are you related to family, fam, uh, Fanny Blankety Blank? She said, yes, how are you related to her? Do you, do you know her? Um, and then I gave her what I, I feel is a very long but comp, uh, fascinating explanation. And I really got an enthusiastic response as a result of that. So um, keep that in mind. Um, obviously, it's common sense to try to find things in common. But triangulation is a really nice way to find what you have in common so that when you reach out to your matches, um, you really get some good and, and enthusiastic responses. So going back to cracking the case person by person in this triangulation group, again, uh, I waited years for response uh, for a response from Bobby, never got a response. Um, but fortunately for me, eventually his sister's family tree showed up at my heritage DNA, um, and that allowed me to uh, crack the case. I built that tree out. It was, there wasn't much in it, but there was enough for me to get started. And I found our shared Spivey connection. And it was really nice. Going back to Mitchell, and this isn't his real name, but um, because of his Hispanic surname, I was uh, encouraged that there might be some hope that um, his line would um, eventually be revealed and that maybe with a Google search, um, we could get somewhere and that's what happened. Um, and I'm really proud of this one, not because I was smart, but because um, I was lucky. Um, I put his name into a Google search along with Spivey and um, on the uh, second page of the Google uh, search results, um, I found um, Mitchell's grandfather's obituary. Um, so really lucky there. Uh, all I had to do was to combine my 
uh, uh, suspicion of Spivey ancestry with uh, Mitchell's name and um, Google did the rest of the work. Um, so with that obituary, I built out um, uh, Mitchell's tree and um, interestingly, this grandfather whose obituary I found uh, was named after um, our most recent common ancestor. So really interesting and fun uh, part of this case. Um, getting back to Pam, again, I mentioned earlier, um, we knew she was a Spivey without really any um, measurable doubt um, long before um, we found out who her parents were. Um, and even after her half-sister half showed up, there were some really challenges, really interesting challenges and, and tricky situations we had to sort through to um, nail it all down. Uh, but we did find out that um, the shared father was a Spivey and um, uh, our um, long-held suspicions were confirmed. This is the family tree that I put together for this triangulation group. Um, this tree is much bigger now because um, new matches come in periodically, um, including some recent additions that I'm really excited about. And um, this is what can come together um, with years of, of work. Um, and without triangulation, I just don't see how this could have happened. Uh, triangulation pro provided some crucial clues over and over and over in the situation. And um, this, is, this is what we came up with. This doesn't show all of the details because of, um, uh, of a need to keep people's uh, private information uh, private, but um, a, a really beautiful family tree in my opi opinion. And uh, we owe these results to triangulation. So some lessons from this. Um, you you want to be sure that you make a lot of comparisons. Um, it sounds um, laborious, probably, um, when you first see it, but with experience, um, the process can be streamlined. Um, and I think um, there are some tricks that really make it almost effortless um, that I can talk about in other presentations. Um, <clears throat> We need to remember that we're not going to find all of our cousins and all of our family members in all of the triangulation groups. Um, so even in my own immediate family, there are people who are not in this triangulation group that we've been talking about. That's just how DNA works. Um, but keep in mind that you will find other triangulation groups that do include the people that um, weren't in um, the, the group that um, we start off with. So in, in, in this example, there are other triangulation groups on other chromosomes where um, other members of my family who aren't in this group are in the other groups. So um, probably didn't explain that very well, but if you keep looking and you understand that you need to look at more than one triangulation group to get the full picture, uh, you'll see how this uh, pans out. And again, another issue, another a lesson from this example, as I mentioned earlier, um, even when we're dealing with um, adoptees and situations where paternity isn't clear or situations where people aren't responding to messages and they don't have family trees, we can still really make some great discoveries if we're willing to work hard. Um, so um, another lesson, um, Match lists get us started with uh, segment triangulation. So match lists are part of the process. Um, I prefer segment triangulation, but match lists, particularly um, at 23andMe and MyHeritage, where automated tools combine the power of match lists with triangulation, um, things are, 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 are really um, easy to do sometimes. Um, and um, remember, once again, um, if you um, do some work and push this forward as far as you can before you reach out to your matches, um, you can get some really enthusiastic responses. So example number two, moving on quickly to example number two, this is another fun one, uh, but a, a different kind of situation. Um, cousin Carl sent a message to my brother. This is a little bit unusual. Usually I'm the one to reach out first. But uh, Carl reached out to my brother and says, hi, it looks like we're cousins. Where are you from? 
this was a super exciting match. This is the kind of match you drop everything you're doing and you focus on this. You, your plans for the evening are, are over. This is this is somebody that really grabs your attention. This is uh, shown as a first cousin at 23 and Me, so a, a huge surprise. Uh, wasn't uh, aware of this person at all. Um, and um, on the match list, again, showing up as a first cousin, approximately 10% of the DNA shared with my brother. Um, again, didn't know who this person was or why they would not be in my tree. Uh, so I went straight to the match list. This is the easiest way to start seeing how things might fit together. Outside of my immediate family, our top match was Misty. I knew about Misty because I had already done some research. Misty um, shares ancestry with my family. Uh, we are descendants of Alexander Hamilton Stevens Dean and Sarah Frances Williams. They were from Tattnall County, Georgia, and this is Tattnall County, Georgia. So this was my first uh, bit of uh, a hint to try to figure out where um, Carl fits in our tree. Um, and so the follow-up question is, is Carl actually uh, a maternal first cousin or a maternal first cousin once removed? Um, I may not have made it clear in this uh, first slide, uh, this connection to Misty is maternal. So the question um, on follow-up, is Carl a maternal first cousin or a maternal first cousin once removed? Um, the amount of DNA shared um, fits with both of those hypotheses. Um, so I looked at uh, the DNA that Carl shares with other siblings in the family, and uh, based on the amount, I, would, I, I concluded that uh, Carl is probably a first cousin once removed. Uh, I won't get into the details of how I made that determination, but that, that's what I uh, determined. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't have DNA from my mother or my father, so wasn't able to go the obvious route. So there was a certain amount of, um, of, of um, uncertainty there. So um, obviously it's, it would be nice to get some information from Carl, maybe that would help, um, but I decided to be patient and hold off and learn more about Carl first if possible. So I scoured, scoured the internet um, hoping to get some information that would make it easier for us to um, find things in common and figure this out. So I did some internet sleuthing. I found Carl's email address, and with that, I was able to um, find uh, Carl's Ancestry username. Again, this was a match from 23andMe, but people who use 23andMe also use Ancestry. Carl was on Ancestry. Um, I found uh, an old tree. Uh, Carl had not tested at Ancestry, but Carl did have a family tree there. Um, it was not a big tree, but it was enough to get started. And in the beginning, what did I find? I found a person of interest, Kay Dean, born in 1887. Um, this was uh, Carl's uh, great-grandmother. And uh, Carl's great-grandmother was born in Appling County, Georgia very near Tattnall County, and um, that really was very nice to find. Uh, Kay Dean's parents were Henry Dean and Nancy Miles. Uh, my fourth great grandparents were the same Henry Dean and his first wife, Lydia Stevens. So have we solved the case? Is this all good now? Um, the answer is emphatically no, we're not good because this Dean relationship reflects a uh, half third cousin, two times removed connection. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, 23andMe was predicting either first cousin or first cousin once removed. And so uh, the amount of DNA um, in this relationship is far too much uh, for the distant relationship we found in the Dean line. So although uh, Misty is a Dean connection and Carl is a Dean connection, we share DNA with Misty. Uh, Carl has Dean family and his family tree. Something's not right because the amount of DNA shared does not match up 
with uh, the distance of that relationship. So what do we do now? At this point, we need to recheck the shared match list, dig a little deeper there. Maybe there's more than initially met the eye. Uh, build out uh, Carl's tree more, talk with Carl. So um, that's what I did. I went further into the shared match list um, at uh, some point shortly after I first um, found Carl or uh, after Carl reached out to us, um, another match showed up a little bit higher than Misty um, and actually was a better match uh, for both of us. But this was a, another Dean connection. The Dean connections for me are um, a maternal grandmother connection. Going down the list, though, things got hairier and more complicated, and we found um, connections to my paternal grandfather in blue, as well as connections to my paternal grandmother in red. So connections all over the place. Um, and um, some of these connections um, were shown to be triangulated segments as indicated here. So um, I don't want to get too much in the details. It gets really complicated um, and messy. And, and that's the problem with matchless triangulation. Um, you can really just get hopelessly confused with um, some of these connections. So um, the solution, I think, is to try other tools. Again, um, on just w page one of 39 pages of matches, we really had a tangled up mess. So uh, building out uh, Carl's trees, I, I look for every potential connection that I could find. I did find another relationship. This relationship was a sixth cousin once removed relationship through our shared ancestors, John Waters and Mary Elizabeth Lee. Unfortunately, um, that doesn't resolve this, even if we add the DNA that we might expect from the more distant relationship with the first relationship that we found. Um, the most extremely generous estimate that we could come up with for that relationship would still only be 200 centimorgans, um, and we're looking for a, a relationship that would explain much more than that. And so we're still not good with what um, the um, family tree analysis was showing us. So again, triangulation to the rescue, segment triangulation to the rescue. What I did in this case was to look for the shared ancestral uh, source of each shared segment. Went segment by segment and said, where did the segment come from? And then I linked each segment to one of my great grandparents. And this is what I found. Here's my uh, brother's chromosome browser result for Carl, and here's my family tree. I put that information together and um, went through segment by segment. Um, the first segment on chromosome one could be assigned to my great-grandfather, Hugh Lee. The second segment on Chromosome one could be assigned to my great-grandmother, Pearl Peoples. There was a segment on chromosome two that could not be definitively assigned to anybody. Um, another segment on chromosome two uh, could be assigned to Hugh, another Hugh, another Pearl, another Pearl, another Hugh, another Pearl, so on and so forth. So to summarize the, the results going through every single segment on every single chromosome, uh, hue and pearl, hue and pearl, over and over and over and over. So that's a really good pattern, really compelling pattern. And uh, added up all of the segments that I could definitively assign to one great grandparent or another, um, 944 centimorgans at least uh, could be assigned to the parents of my grandfather, Ralph Lee. So really nice results there, really compelling results, saying that um, we can narrow things down quite well.
So lessons from example two, matchless triangulation can be a big mess. Messy is clearly the word that describes uh, matchless triangulation in a lot of cases. And segment triangulation can really cut through the clutter and um, provide a lot of focus. Um, another lesson I would say from this case is that segment triangulation isn't only for distant cousins. I think segment triangulation might have a reputation for being less useful for adoptees or NPEs or um, other situations. Um, and I think there's an assumption that segment triangulation isn't necessary um, when we're dealing with uh, close relatives like first cousins. But I found that it can help quite a bit, even in the context of intermarriage and endogamy. I mean, you can see where things were fairly tangled up for uh, my family and Carl's family. Um, so those are some important um, lessons there. As it turns out, um, Carl's family tree, it, there's more than meets the eye. Um, and um, we can get into that, but we're going to uh, respect privacy. Um, sometimes what uh, people believe to be their accurate family tree is not, um, is, is not accurate, and, and that's what we found in this case. So moving on to example number three, Stevens um, started research on this case in 2014, and at that point the genetic genealogy bases were very small, and I was excited about this 31.2 centimorgan match uh, because at that point a 31.2 centimorgan match was a really good match. Um, a match like this might not really even come to my attention anymore because we have so many matches who are so much closer. Um, but fortunately, I did notice this match before uh, matches of this magnitude uh, became um, harder to um, identify as good matches. And, and, and now they're kind of like needles in the haystack. Um, I uh, sent a message to this match. I said, uh, Blank Furkowski is showing up as a substantial match to me on family tree DNA. Most of my recent ancestry is from Georgia. I'd like to try to identify a connection. And again, this is a case where I had done some research in advance to find out what might be interesting to this person. This person um, had recently discovered that he had um, ancestry from the state of Georgia. Um, it was a new discovery. Um, based on um, some, some new information. And so um, this was something that would be of interest to him. Uh, Tim Furkowski replied to me. He gave me permission to share his story. He said, hi, Jason. I recently identified my biological grandfather, and he came from Georgia. Since this was a recent discovery, I have not had a chance to delve into that line of my family yet. You may be interested in reading my blog series about it. So um, I'll, I'll share some of his blog posts um, some excerpts quickly to give you the context. So he says, in 1985, when I returned to the U.S. after being married in Germany while I was stationed there in the Army, my mother told me something that I had not known. She informed me that the grandfather that I knew was not my biological grandfather. She explained that she had found out accidentally when she was young and that it was her mother's wish that us kids did not know about this until we were married. Although I was a bit surprised, it did not really matter to me because I still considered the grandfather that I knew, Jerome Kachi, to be my grandfather. I asked my mother what she knew about her biological father, and she said that she did not know much. She remembered the name William Bond and that he was in the Navy and may have been from Georgia. So he hit the paper trail, and he found really good evidence that his biological grandfather was actually William D. Bond, and he even managed to find a photo of William D. Bond from his Naval personnel records. He goes on to say, I wanted to make sure that I had covered one more base before my final conclusion. My mother had agreed to take a DNA test so that her DNA would be on file, and if any question came up in the future as to her being a descendant of William D. Bond, I would have genetic proof. So really happy he did that. I sent in the test kits and recently received the results on my mother's DNA test. There were over 500 matches that were listed. Those matches were not close relatives. What was interesting about what I saw is that there were a number of matches with families in Georgia and Virginia. This is important because my mother's maternal ancestry is French Canadian, French Canadian going way back. William D. Bond and his ancestry is in Georgia and Virginia. I also noted that some of the matches had the Bond family in their ancestry. So again, this is not a fantastic match. The, the shared set of Morgans is relatively low. 
Um, but the Georgia connections and the DNA shared with my family made this an interesting case to pursue. Um, Tim's family is uh, mostly from uh, lines that are um, far separated from uh, my lines, uh, but we do share a connection through that biological grandfather. Um, and I took it upon myself to learn more about William Bond and looked at his, his ancestry and found one couple um, of interest in particular, uh, uh, Isham Stevens and Mary McDonald. Um, the Stevens name jumped out at me. I have two Stevens lines. Uh, both of my maternal grandparents have Steven, Stevens lines. Um, uh, they're, they're distant cousins, my maternal grandmother and my uh, maternal grandfather are distant cousins. So um, that complicated things a bit and I was a little bit discouraged. I thought maybe this is going to be a tough one to really sort out. But eventually I did sort it out and I sent him a message outlining it all. I won't get into the details here. I don't want to take too much time. Um, and, and I spelled all of that out. You can um, watch this video again later if you want to review all of those details. Um, but in the end, um, I put together the data and the family tree information and came up with these connections. Uh, this is me. Uh, this represents my siblings. Um, this represents um, a, a, a relatively close match of mine. A couple of other descendants of the Stevens couple that I share with Tim. This is how we all fit together. We all triangulate. It's really nice. There, there are new matches that have been added to this since I, I created this set of slides. Uh, very interesting case. And again, it's based on a fairly distant match. So I want to emphasize that low centimorgan research can be fruitful and interesting, particularly if you're interested in finding DNA evidence to connect to um, people who are pretty high up in your tree several generations back. Um, and, and if you're patient and you wait for new matches to come along, uh, you can end up with uh, matches with, who are um, closer to you and provide higher Cinemorgan pieces for the puzzle. So um, what appears to be a kind of weak case right now, confusing, messy, um, not attractive case today, uh, could become a really solid and interesting and clear case in the future. So be patient. Uh, that would be one of my lessons. Um, one more lesson for this uh, match or for this uh, triangulation group. Um, there is another group of matches living on chromosome 6 in this specific location. So I have two groups of matches living on the same chromosome in the same location. The second group of matches does not match the first group of matches that I've been talking about so far on chromosome 6. And the question would be, why is this happening? Why is there a second group of matches? They match each other, but they don't match the first group. And yet we've got two groups in one spot. What, what does this mean? So the answer to that question is that whereas the first group that I talked about is maternal, the second group is paternal. So the first group is a bunch of my maternal relatives, my mom's relatives, the second group is a bunch of my dad's relatives. So they all match me. They all show up on the same part of the same chromosome. They all match me. Um, but they match different subsets of my immediate family. So um, the paternal set uh, line up with me, sibling two and sibling eight. Um, the maternal set line up with me sibling two, sibling four, sibling five, sibling six, and sibling seven. Um, similarly, the maternal matches line up with my daughter and my young, younger son, whereas the paternal matches align up with my elder son. Um, if you have the opportunity to test multiple siblings or your kids, this is really a nice way to, of sorting things out. It works exceedingly well. It's, it feels like magic. It's so good. Um, so, um, I won't get into the details on, 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 on that issue right now. I've talked about it in other presentations, um, but just I want to plant the seeds and have that out there for people to think about. It's, it's really nice. The paternal group, uh, as it turns out, 
um, are uh, descendants of Samuel Sellers and Mary Bishop. So that's been sorted out uh, to, um, we'll get into the science here in a second um, to understand how this works a little better. But uh, before I get to that, I'm gonna talk about the chromosome browser results for these people. Um, and again, uh, if you're new to this, this one might be a little bit hard to follow. Uh, you can watch this again later. I just want to plant the seeds, as I say. I just want to plant the seeds so you can see um, how these things work. So if I compare all of these, uh, if I compare um, two of the paternal uh, matches with me, these are the paternal ones, and uh, two of the maternal matches with me from these two groups, you can see they all match me. Um, and there's some overlap. Um, you can see the square shows that they all... Um, are in roughly the same location. They all live on the same part of chromosome six. Uh, the, the top two are maternal, big red square. Top two are uh, maternal from mom. The bottom two are paternal from dad. Okay, so um, we have two groups. If we flip things around with the chromosome browser at 23andMe and we compare everyone with Diane, Diane is from mom's side. Uh, she matches Robert and she matches me, but she doesn't match these cousins from dad's side as we would expect. And, th and that's why all of this uh, plays out the way it does. Similarly, if we pull out Anne and compare everybody, everybody with Anne, Anne is one of my uh, paternal cousins, a cousin from dad's side. If we compare everyone with Anne, um, she matches Madison here on chromosome six, one of my paternal cousins, one of my cousins from my dad's side. She matches me, but she doesn't share any DNA at all with Diane and Robert, my maternal cousins, cousins from mom's side. So hopefully that begins to clarify things. Why does this happen? Because for each chromosome, we actually have two copies. There, there are two copies of each chromosome, one from mom, one from dad. Um, it's not, there's not uh, just one chromosome six, there's two. We all have two copies of chromosome six, one from mom and one from dad. So again, uh, two copies of chromosome six, one from mom, one from dad. And so we get uh, two sets of matches for each part of each chromosome. Uh, one set from mom, one set from dad. And this is why we triangulate. We have to triangulate because of current technology. Um, at this stage, um, this doesn't sort itself out. Um, with, with some of the DNA testing companies, with some of the settings, um, if you've tested at least one of your parents or both, then there is some sorting. There is some automatic sorting. Um, but um, whoever is the oldest generation, whoever represents the oldest generation, whoever has been tested, uh, you're going to encounter this problem. So um, if you tested yourself and your mom and your dad, this is sorted out nicely for you. Uh, but if uh, you haven't tested your grandparents, then... Um, the, your mom and your dad's matches are going to be unsorted and you're going to have to sort those. So there's always a sorting issue. Um, no matter um, who you've tested, uh, you certainly want to test as many people as you can. You want to go as high up the tree as you can, but whoever's at that highest level in the tree is going to have unsorted matches. So the sorting problem is always there. Um, so this is why we triangulate. Um, it helps us to sort, helps us to clarify, gives us some nice insights, helps us to do really rigorous research that we can actually document. Um, and, and the way that we document paper trail, we want to be just as conscientious with our DNA data. Um, I think a lot of people treat, treat DNA data as second class evidence, and it's just kind of a hint generator. It's helpful for hunches, but then you really get down to the nitty gritty when you do your DNA, excuse me, when you do your uh, paper trail research. That's the real um, hard stuff, um, the, real, um, the, real, the real good stuff. 
Um, I think we can treat DNA with the same amount of respect that we treat the paper trail, and in some cases, the DNA gets us closer to the truth. So um, if we want to do rigorous research and we want to use DNA for more than just uh, a nice, funny little pie chart um, that, that shows us that um, we're 99% uh, um, uh, German, then um, we really want to go to that um, next level and, and look at the details. And ultimately, um, the, the nice thing about um, the detailed research is it can really help us to make the personal connections, to, to find the stories and the evidence that uh, get people interested in working together with us and, and finding more. So with that, I'd love to talk even more about all of this. Uh, I had to cut out a lot to make it a reasonable length, but uh, thanks again for having me and um, look for me in um, Ancestry DNA Matching. That's a Facebook group that I spend a lot of time in, Ancestry DNA Matching. You can also contact me directly at uh, jxleefam at gmail.com, j-x-l-e-e-f-a-m at gmail.com. I really appreciate it, and that's the end.